Nie meer hal. Uh, hi and uh, welcome to the cinema of the DFF, the Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum. My name is Laura Teixeira and I welcome you all very um, warmly here to our cinema, to our lecture series dedicated to the work of Cha Jung Ke. Um, this is a cooperation with the Institute of uh, Theatre, Film and Media of the Goethe University, together with the normative orders and with the support of the Hessen Film and Media Academy, the Confucius Institute, the Forschungszentrum Historische Geisteswissenschaft, the Sinologie, the city of Frankfurt and the friends of the Goethe University. I'm very happy that all of them are contributing for us to bring you this um, large program. As you know, we, are, um, we have started in October and this program is going until July next year. You can find all the program in our flyer and also online on our website www.cha-zanke.de um, There you can see also all the updated information about the other films we're going to be screening accompanying this series. Um, we are very happy that um, we have Dudley Andrew here tonight with us and he's going to be introduced by Daniel Fairfax in a moment. I would just like to say two our, um, um organization uh, things. Uh, well, first, um, we are uh, the next lecture on the 12th of December. Um, we are still working on the visa for Dai Jinghua that should come and uh, present us the film Dong. Um, it, we're still not sure if it's going to happen. We are going to have an event and lecture here on the 12th and we'll, we're doing our best to bring Dai Jinghua from China. In case that doesn't work for the 12th, we'll definitely bring her in a later date next year. So um, we'll keep you updated in our website and also on the Facebook page of the DFF. So um, follow us there to um, be on top of that. Um, we are also working to bring uh, Jia himself. Uh, that is uh, planned for February next year. We still don't have the final date yet, but uh, we will be informing you as soon as we can. Um, tonight's program, as you know, we're screening the film The World. I would like to um, apologize for a small mistake in our flyer where it says the film is uh, 85 minutes long. It's actually a little bit longer. It's uh, 140 minutes long. So uh, I hope you all stay until the end because as always after the film we have a Q&A and the chance here to discuss the film, ask questions about the lecture, about the film with um, our guest of tonight. So um, as Always, I would like to ask uh, our dear um, partner of this program as well, Daniel Fairfax, to present tonight's guest, Dudley Andrew. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Laura, and thank you, obviously, to the DFF as well for their long and fruitful partnership with the uh, Institute for Theater, Film and Medienwissenschaften at the Goethe Universität, uh, which has made this program possible. Uh, here, I think this is uh, one of the high this film today is one of the highlights of the of the um, of the years if not of, of the year if not of the series in general Dudley himself will speak more about that I just wanted to say a few words about Dudley uh, to kick things off uh, if you were to draw up a family tree of uh, film of the film studies discipline in the United States a large proportion of that would actually be able to trace their lineage back to Dudley Andrew. He's a kind of Adam figure of film studies, let's say. Uh, one of a, a select few uh, who could really uh, were there at the start. Uh, he was, actually, as he, as he said, he only recently realized, and this will be important as you'll find out in a minute, uh, born in January 1945, the month that uh, Andre Bazan's article, uh, Ontology of the Photographic Image, uh, was first published. <laughs> So he was, uh, it was already in the stars uh, what, uh, uh, what Dudley's fate would be. Uh, he was very precocious uh, in um, first completing his PhD and then getting a, an academic position at the University of Iowa already in the early 1970s, uh, from which point he was really able to uh, develop a whole generation of film studies scholars. Uh, and as it turns out, in these ensuing decades, multiple generations of uh, film studies scholars, both in Iowa uh, and then at, the, at Yale University, where he moved in 2000 and where he's still professor of film studies. Uh, he's published uh, some of the real canonical uh, texts uh, for the field, uh, notably uh, the major film theories and film concepts, uh, 
which I think, even though written in the in the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, still actually uh, having recently reread them, hold up as very good introductions to uh, the theoretical traditions uh, that make up this field. Uh, they they have aged very well, I would say. Uh, but possibly he's most well known for his biography of Andre Bazan. Uh, which uh, was published in English initially uh, in the late 70s, 78, uh, and uh, was discovered by none other than Francois Truffaut, who said, what is it, what, this American who's written a biography of, of our Andre Bazin, why, didn't, why, weren't we, why hadn't we done this already? Uh, Truffaut very quickly arranged for a French translation of that book to come out. And again, it, it's... Uh, it's a text that has aged very well. It's recently um, reissued slightly in a slightly amended uh, version. And if you ever want an introduction to Bazan's ideas and Bazan's life, uh, this book is still really the go-to uh, book. Andre Bazan has, as a uh, theorist, occupied Dudley for many years since that time. Uh, even uh, in 2008, he uh, co-organized a conference on Bazan, opening Bazan with Hervé Joubert Laurencin that took place both in uh, Paris and in New Haven, where Dudley resides, uh, which I think really does count as one of the landmark uh, film studies conferences of, of recent years, uh, and which became the book, Opening Bazan, uh, published a couple of years later. Uh, but his field of interests are not limited to Bazin, not limited to French cinema, although that is one of his great passions. Uh, in fact, Dudley uh, is remarkably, uh, let's say, eternally youthful in his cinematic taste. He's, he endeavors to stay in touch with uh, contemporary cinema, uh, with what he finds valuable in contemporary cinema. Uh, he kind of wrote a, a manifesto-like text of his own in 2010, I believe, What Cinema Is?, of course, we know Bazan, or many of us, not all of us, but maybe many of us know that Bazan's uh, first collection of texts uh, was uh, called what, what's, what is Cinema with a question mark? And this is the kind of exclamatory response by Dudley uh, as to what the cinema is today. Uh, in that book, uh, talking about the, the type of contemporary film that uh, Dudley sees as being worth uh, defending, worth advocating, worth writing about, worth... Uh, exploring uh, on a deep level. Uh, Jia Zhangke is one of the real prominent figures in that book, uh, along with many others. But I think Jia Zhangke's films uh, really occupy, for Dudley, a kind of privileged position in, in world cinema today. Uh, and he will tell us more about that in his lecture. Uh, but but Jia Zhangke's work as a whole is very important for Dudley. He's interviewed um, him a, a few times now. Uh, but uh, in, in a way, the world, uh, the, the actual film, the world is kind of the, let's say, the paradigmatic film for, for Dudley's considerations of Jia Zhangke as a filmmaker. Um, in a way, it, it exemplifies what Dudley finds interesting in contemporary world cinema, both as the type of film he uh, admires and, and seeks to advocate, uh, but also, of course, because it's a film that is really speaking so closely about what does it mean to be in the world today? What does it mean to be in a, in a kind of globalized world, but one in which there are still so many fractures and it's uh, we're far from uh, living in, let's say, a smooth world. Um, and Dudley will talk about that uh, imminently. Uh, on a personal note, uh, just to end, Dudley was what, what the Germans will call my thesis father. Uh, so I'm part of that family tree myself. Um, and indeed, my first encounter of, of the world, uh, the Jia Zhangke's film, was in Dudley's uh, contemporary world cinema class, uh, initially as a student and then as a teaching assistant a few years later. And it's a film I come back to, but uh, it's a film in which uh, I can always kind of I always echoes it, it always echoes in my mind uh, what Dudley uh, has said about the film on multiple occasions, and now he will give a kind of a fresh take on the film. Let's say so. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dudley Andrew. Well, that's a, a wonderfully sentimental opening, which uh, I hardly approve of. So thank you, Danny, for being uh, in the nearly the end of the long line of people that it, it is true I've had the privilege of talking uh, talking to in classes and watching develop. And I love it that you're here uh, with Vincent Heidegger and the uh, wonderful program that, that is developed here at Frankfurt and that you've got this great relationship with this uh, stunning museum, which I was privileged to 
to tour a couple of years ago, and I thought this is what we should have uh, in the United States, more of this. I was able to choose this film uh, for reasons that he just mentioned, uh, that I do think it's a really crucial film of a director that I find uh, among the, the greatest, uh, greatest directors working today. This is why I'm still in this business. The new century uh, belongs, we are told, to China, whose national cinema is said to be reaching a scale equivalent to that of Hollywood in its heyday. China's industry aims to copy Hollywood in its infrastructure, its genres, its marketing, and in my view, it's becoming progressively less urgent and more banal because of that. Um, but outside the Chinese studios, which everyone's talking about, uh, you can still find the legacy of the urban generation, those filmmakers from the late 1990s uh, who registered with raw images the consequences of China's market socialism and the unprecedented urbanization it, that it produced. Those films definitely felt urgent in the 90s and into the early 2000s. And they reached audiences through clandestine routes and from scarcely identifiable sources, most of them being banned in China itself. They were completely marginal to the solid studio system that in that period was still producing about 150 films regularly every year. But nothing was, you couldn't predict anything about the sixth generation, at least not immediately. Festival programmers had to rely on word of mouth to locate the most promising films and trends with the aid of box office buzz or of local festivals or critical reactions. Uh, yet there were films by Yu Lai, uh, Wang Xiaocha, uh, uh, Zhang Yuan, and others who grabbed the interest of cinephiles everywhere. And uh, among them, the, the greatest by far, and it was immediately recognized, was Zha Zhangka. He's the poet of the post-Mao China, and he's been chronicling the experience of a billion people swiftly moving from a static, state-protected socialist and largely rural culture into the hyperdynamic urban one, fueled by controlled but ruthless competition and the licensed displacements of, of peoples, incalculable numbers of people. His art has brought into view the millions who live in limbo between hometown and city center, construction workers, uh, entertainers, migrants of every sort. His masterpieces from 2004 to 2006, The World and Still Life, uh, show us really uh, what it was like uh, to be at the implacable structure of a system. They also show the structure of experience, the, the class feeling, let's say, that this produced within the workers who are caught up in it. So this is just a list of the films and that, that you've probably already um, been through in introductions to his world. So the world, in the film that we're about to see, drifters from Shanxi province, which is to the uh, north, effectively west of, um, of Beijing and a bit north. Um, often speaking dialect are tossed together in the bowels of a Beijing theme park that advertises a tour of the world without ever leaving home. But these workers have left home and they're stranded in the edge of the metropolis, exploited to entertain a new urban class. Russian women arrive, as you'll see, driven into the sex trade that is just a step down from where the heroine, Xiao Tao, finds herself. Xiao Tao, the heroine, forms a sentimental link to the construction laborers drawn from Shanxi, her hometown, some of whom are actually worked to death in the capital. Now, one of those uh, Shanxi workers uh, becomes the hero of Zha's next film, uh, Still Life, and you're going to, you haven't seen that one yet, right? Okay. Be sure to see it. Uh, traveling south in search of the wife and daughter whom the economy has drawn away from home, he lands in the midst of the monumental Three Gorges hydropower dam project that displaced some half a million people. And then temporarily it attracted bands of wandering work crews, of which this guy is one of them. Um, the film ends with a hero gesturing to his fellow migrant workers to follow him north to the mines in Shanxi that he knows so well. And given Jia Zhangke's uh, view of contemporary China, this amounts to a happy ending. His genius, Jia's genius, uh, stems from his having intuited the appropriate scale at which to view, sketch, and record Chinese life in transition. And it's a critical concept that I'm trying to come to grips with, but I think the greatest artists figure out the right scale at which to represent things that are really almost beyond the comprehension of the rest of us. And I think he's found the right, the proper scale, and you'll be able to test that tonight. His fictions and his actors, some of whom return film after film, can be quite involving as we follow their private concerns. There is a plot to this. I'm trying not to give away much of it. It's less important than the overall experience. 
But all these, uh, these characters and their plots are involved in a world that actually reaches out well beyond their personal fabricated drama. It's a world populated by others who are faced them down by the institutions, the regulations, the technology that they're involved in. Background and foreground inter inter interact so intricately that we have to give up trying to distinguish pertinent gestures, actions, and words. We cannot tell what relates directly to the characters named in the credits as opposed to what generally belongs just to the environment. Everything seems germane. Everything is in some sense documentary. In following the fates of the featured players to the end, we follow a mass movement and the conditions that have brought it about and that it, in turn, affects. Zhajanka has succeeded in something which is, I think is really quite rare, something for which uh, Italian neorealism perhaps provided the, most, uh, the, the great inspiration. He's brought out, he's articulated, a previously unremarked or unseen reality, that of an entire non-class of human beings. A mass now has been given a face and something of a voice in the social geography. He made this happen. I think we now know what the Zhajanka people look like, and there's really no name for them sociologically. Maybe people are coming to it, but it was the artist that brought it out. You're going to see some of them tonight, and if you watch his other films, you're seeing them as well. This effort to figure the invisible and the ignored is what art, at its most consequential, is always aimed for. Political art, when it is at the cutting edge of historical moments, Goya's paintings, let's say, or Mel Rowe in fiction, those are some of my favorites, it exposes the system that consumes its subjects. Jajanka intuited a form that the cinema needed to adopt in order to reach this particular political edge. He photographed the bodies of migrant laborers and the particular dramas of a couple of these in an economy that uses them up and that they can transcend or unsettle as best they can. Now, in succession, his major films have progressively zoomed back to take, uh, in, to take in wider aspects and dimensions of the socioeconomic change that bewilders not just his characters, but an entire nation. The world, stuck close to the conditions and dreams of those working literally under the world theme park or in the construction zones of the capital. In Still Life, the next film that he makes, he focused on two different characters coming from the same place and winding up in the same changing last landscape thanks to distinct personal plot. And then in Touch of Sin, which you see down here below, he pulled back further still to render a fragmented national map via four brutal vignettes, in each of which the flayed bodies of characters are somehow strong enough to disrupt the machinery of what the state considers progress. Traditional values uh, that seem quaint in our cynical era steal, they give uh, strength to a small spectrum of people against the indignities of their situations in Touch of Sin. Uh, all of them are chewed up by the new values of contemporary China. This uh, synchronic montage of a brutal nation cut across four sections of, um, of, of China gives way to Jia's latest feature, Ash is Purest White, where it's a diachronic representation of this clash of values in three historical slices, 2001, 2006, 2018. I'd love to know which of these films you've been able to see here. Uh, touching several of the locations of his earlier films, uh, but set primarily in Datong, the capital of Jia's native Shanxi province, progress and decadence are graphically visible on the faces and the living conditions of its characters. So like nobody else, Jia has felt and pictured the royal of China in movement. Its slow surge out of the quarter century of Mao's ironclad control, he was six when Mao died, filling its sails with uh, the breezes of music and films coming from intermittently from the West, China sailed into the 1980s toward what seemed like limitless horizons. Uh, I got to go there before Tiananmen Square, and I could feel this movement going forward. Like many other scholars, we all sensed that modernism uh, was on the, uh, uh, on the make there. The diligence, the concentration, and the hopes was, were palpable at the Beijing Film Academy where I was lecturing. And they hadn't really condemned uh, five years later when Zsa Zhanka actually arrived also at the Beijing Film Academy in the early 1990s. Effectively, he grew with the country that he soon set about expressing. A teenager in the 80s, he was like the economy itself, rambunctious and naive, pushing forward and not knowing quite what was out there that he was going toward. The football that you see in those early films, the music, the breakdancing, the motorcycling, the minor hooliganisms, 
that his group engaged in, that he personally engaged in, in this little province, provincial town where a city that he was in. This is what the bureaucrats of uh, China, Beijing and Shanghai uh, were trying to harness so that they could bring out a new, new initiatives and a much more robust culture. The film Platform, which really brought him to the world stage, embodies the moment of personal and cultural adolescence about to confront both uh, the father at Tiananmen Square and the larger world beyond Shanxi for the characters uh, and also for, uh, uh, for beyond China for Zha Zhangka because the film was not shown in China, it was shown abroad. He claims he was the only one of his buddies to leave their hometown. Everybody else was stuck where they were. It was hard to move in those days. But the whole thrust of their dreaming together was to get beyond their circumstances, to drive off on their motorcycles, their shirts flap flapping in the, in the wind behind them. And in just this way, the exuberant and expectant 1980s are fondly remembered by many who a decade later became entrepreneurs, many of which quite ruthless ones. Zha Zhanka wants never to leave this place in period completely behind. It was here in Shanxi that, the, that he found the source of his growth spurt. And so he returns to shoot in Shanxi to tap the energy that he feels, as well as to, uh, to grasp through his camera and microphone the special texture of the place's architecture and populace, their gestures, their dialect, their silly jokes and absurd rituals. The least successful of his films among the critics and the public has been the one that you started with, I Wish I Knew a commission piece for the Shanghai World Exposition. And it's, I think it's cut, it's cut off from his own personal past. Knowing the danger of, loo of losing touch and of taking on subjects that the upper crust world, his, the, he, I mean, he has been lifted into this new world of uh, very wealthy uh, people, uh, entrepreneurs, artists. He's in danger of, of losing what he was great at, that is representing the, the world that he came from. And so he's taken pretty much care, more than almost any most artists, to keep close to Fenyang, his home city. That's where he helped establish a literary festival in 2015, before setting up his highly publicized Pingyao October Film Festival that Danny Fairfax was just at. But there's no use pretending. Jia is undercover whenever he's in Shanxi. He's become, uh, or against his will maybe, a national spokesman, a citizen of the world. The first time uh, I think it was the first time I met him in 2008 in Shang, uh, Shanghai. I was there with many other important people, um, not me, he was there with other important people, including Ho Xiao Shen. And when we came out of the little conference we were in, there were rushes of uh, young boys and girls in school costumes racing to get his autograph. It was hundreds of them. So he, he has to be undercover. Yes, okay, the world. He is a citizen of the world. This is the title of the film that brought him exceptional international recognition, although ironically, it was the first of his works to be licensed for national distribution. His first three, his hometown trilogy, uh, were, had to be distributed by piracy and uh, illegally. Its place in his oeuvre and in, in Chinese uh, history, I think, is crucial. Pursuing the biographical allegory, after his first two films, uh, Pickpocket and Platform, uh, it showed the, with nostalgia, really, the failure of the pipe dreams of provincial youth, and then after unknown pleasures left its deracinated and disillusioned characters suspended on an unfinished highway somewhere between a hometown that no longer feels like home and a burgeoning, inhospitable city that they sense before them. The world represents life in the center of China, which is playfully figured as the center of the world. The problem is that the location of this film is not exactly Beijing, but rather a rather tawdry theme park in the suburbs. And the characters, the main ones at least, aren't locals. They don't even speak Mandarin to each other, but dialect. And when not performing as foreigners, dancers from India or a mounted horseman, they speak, um, they, or uh, they're held captive under, underground, really in their cheap uh, sleeping quarters, or they live nearby. Some of them, you'll see a Russian in the, who gets involved in the, it's, driven into the sex trade, are literally captive, their, their passports kept by their handler. Xiao Tao, the heroine, and her boyfriend, Taisheng, uh, seem free by contrast, but they really haven't the means to go it alone, and if it, they don't go back to Shanxi, they don't, have, they don't have passports. Much of this is eloquently represented in the riveting credit sequence, uh, where, which 
you'll see, I'm going to show you some images of things as kind of like previews, and I hope you're not upset by this. You can complain later on, and I'll have learned a lesson. Um, but I, I'm, going to, I'm trying not to interpret the film, but just to show you some things that I just find you have to look at, and then we can talk about them later on. So there's a, an old rag man who uh, is, pulls his rucksack full of old clothes or whatever it is across the screen, then pauses to glance at the spectator. And if you'll see, this is right when Zsa Zsanka's directorial credit comes up. It's as if the, the, the director is winking at us. Behind him, the park's version of the Eiffel Tower stands to signal modernity. You have two time zones here superimposed, the slow time of the provincial rag picker and the time of businessmen in Beijing. Now, in a recent book that I like quite a lot, Li Yang's uh, The Formation of Chinese Art Cinema, 1900 to 2003, she moves toward the highlight chapter on Zsa Zsanka, but she leaves him at the cusp of, the major, of his major successes. The book stops in 2003. Why? Because that year was the year that uh, the Chinese government recognized the sixth generation filmmakers officially. They called them the underground filmmakers and recruited them effectively into the system, but kept them on the margins. It was a nice strategy. The world, then, is indeed about underground entertainers who are tied uh, uh, to a constricting system to which they nevertheless contribute. Beijing was at the center of the Maoist world into which Zhao was born and toward which he inevitably gravitated during his adolescence. It was also the adolescence of modern China. And he and his country grew muscular and outward looking during the 1980s and early 90s. The world that he then found when he arrived in Beijing in 1993 would represent, uh, he would represent a decade later, it felt disproportioned by 2004, out of scale. Through a series of ingeniously interlinked film techniques, Zsa Zsanka represents a totality. And here I'm thinking of Frederick Jameson's term, which he gets from Lukash and other people. Uh, uh, it tries to represent a totality. I mean, the title itself, the world, you can't not think of this. It first extends the borders of the theme park that both the film and its name uh, and, the cir and, it also, and the circumstances of its characters go out beyond that. And second, it drills deep into the core of this non-place uh, and the culture that it pretends to represent. So the giant strides that this director has taken since 2004 ironically push off from the breadth and the depth and the solidity, I would say, of this magnificent film, which is all about insubstantiality. Like many cinephiles, I've been disappointed in the last films of uh, Chen Kaioga and uh, Zhang Yimou. Um, and this is the first film that Zsa Zsanka saw that made him want to be a filmmaker. It's Chen, uh, uh, Chen Kaioga's Yellow Earth, from, um, usually dated as, as uh, 1983-84. Their late films, however, take them uh, several decades later, emerge or don't, don't speak from the margins as these did, but from the center of power where impressive panoramas are spread out. And this is from his film, The Promise. In 2005, I chose it because it's effectively it was on screen at the same time as the world. Every frame uh, and every image can be seen. He, they have impressive panoramas. At the opening ceremony for the 2008 Olympic Games, uh, we saw this demonstrated when Zhang Yimou produced the mag such magnificent spectacles as we've ever seen for about half a billion dollars. However, M. A. Césaire war warned, life is not a spectacle, and a more daring cinema searches for what is not yet understood. And so a battle, drawn, uh, battle line has been drawn between Zsa Zhangke and Zhang Yimou and Chen Koga, the two of them I'm putting together here. The bitter controversy involves more than the standard fight between art and entertainment industry, it involves actually the whole nature of cinema, I think, and at every level. The differences are apparent. This is more of the CGI world of uh, The Promise. So Chen Kaiga could boast that he shot The Promise in super 35 millimeter. He, he said, that's what I'm shooting in. But his film's original, uh, originality surely comes from the CGI graphics that you're seeing here, where cinematography submits itself to the alchemy of the digital. The product looks like some type of animation, I would say. Zsa Zsanka reverses this. Although he shot the world with a small digital camera, he edited it as if it were camera captured and 
and if it were immutable with sync sound, long takes, and dead time. He aimed for 35 millimeter cinemascope projection. We're going to be seeing a Blu-ray tonight, but uh, it was originally projected uh, around the world in 35 millimeter. So there's a technical chiasmus here, whereby the digital and the photochemical production practices are flipped. And it emerges also at the aesthetic level in the world, as the one of the editors, he was the editor of Cahiers du Cinema at the time, Emmanuel Bourdieu, intuited when he reviewed it for that magazine. He said, scale in this film is systematically convoluted in that characters who work amidst miniatures uh, of civilization's most stupendous monuments funnel their dreams uh, into cell phones whose LCD screens are then inflated to widescreen and brilliantly colored animated sequences. So the grandeur of architectural ma masterpieces has been shrunk to fit into the theme park while the ordinary hopes of young people grow to gigantic proportions. Beyond format and aesthetics uh, is the level of cultural effect and critical response where yet another chiasmus can be seen. Chen Kaiuga's blockbusters uh, really were defl deflated by uh, the critical pinpricks of spectators. Effectively, its reputation collapsed in inverse proportion to the pomp of its self-presentation. The world, on the other hand, writing the irony of its title and the reputation of its modest director, quickly transcended its minuscule box office to grow into a critical stature and become a touchstone for world cinema. So Jaws Reputation, which you can see here, it's on the cover of a, one, probably the one, maybe the best book on world cinema in, in English as an anthology. His reputation is neither uh, that of a state spokesman nor of a cosmopolitan auteur, I would say. He's perhaps closest to we have to something like an organic intellectual, the kind that Gramsci uh, wanted, uh, tried, wanted to produce in the world. So uh, there is a comparison that was been made, has been made between Gramsci and um, and Jia uh, by Peng Cha that has influenced my thinking about this film because uh, both uh, Gramsci and Jia are speaking as intellectual workers within a working class. Their job is to bring out that class and bring it to critical awareness of its political position and foster a desire for social alternatives. But globalization and migration, the subject of Jia's films, all of his films, stretches the notion of the organic to the point where it really may break down. This is brilliantly illustrated through scenes of the world that indicate the participation uh, of the workers in their own dehumanization and their acceptance of the artificial. Jia is, I would say, ambivalent in this lament because as nostalgic as he may be for the hometown, hometown, hometown life that his characters have left behind, the very existence of this, of this film is a measure of the possibilities of global connectedness. Sharing the director's ambivalence, you will watch and rewatch the world for its artistic solutions to problems that may be philosophically intransigent. There may be no way out of what we're, you're about to see. Jia Zhanka has built a beautiful, if devastating, object, a world, really, out of the conundrums that he, like China itself, faces in this social, economic, and philosophical moment of globalization. So let's go to its unavoidable title. Xi Jie, which is the Chinese title, simply takes its name from the theme park that is the film's chief location. In Western languages, we call it the world, le monde, die Welt. It necessarily raises questions. Can totality be imagined in our era of fragmentation, of cell phones? <laughs> well, we're going to see that. And yet our era is that of globalization in commerce, politics, and in the state of cinema. World cinema has been on the tongues of producers. That, that phrase, world cinema, has been on the tongues of producers and critics, like me. I use it all the time. Since just about the time that Jia Zhanka was graduating from the Beijing Film Academy in the mid-90s and entering the profession. And from the outset, despite treating specifically Chinese subjects, he has operated as a world director. His first three features were not released in his homeland, as I've mentioned but they really came along because of film festival attention and DVD distribution. Also, much of his financing comes from offshore. The world, his biggest production to that date, was backed by two of uh, Kitano Takeshi's companies in Tokyo and by Lumen Films, a new French company specializing in Asian productions. Funding also came from the French government, uh, it's uh, Fonds Sud, which um, often aids filmmakers in struggling economies, and from his own financial entity, 
uh, extreme. Especially crucial to that director was the uh, pr participation of the Shanghai Film Corporation Group, just the fifth such venture of what is now a major producer, because that uh, gave him official ability to distribute the film in China, the first time his name was, he was able to have a film travel throughout the country. But I think it was Hong Kong where he settled his, he settled his company that he considers the seat of the film. Um, that's where Extreme Pictures uh, has been. Here's what he said. My activities cannot be guaranteed within China. I need an open space, an international one, to, fund, uh, to find investors. So I've chosen Hong Kong since it still keeps uh, some space and it's a Chinese place. I've established my seat in Hong Kong since it's difficult to count on international collaborations in Beijing. So I wonder what he thinks of Hong Kong now. And I wonder what he uh, thinks generally about the politics of things. He now has, has risen to a position um, as a delegate of the National People's Congress. This is a man who stayed pretty free of uh, political controversies. He tried to play it right, uh, but he recognizes his responsibilities. And he's been even supporting Zhang Yimou, uh, his bitter enemy uh, at the time of the still life when they were having huge fights one against the other. And now he's supporting him because Zhang, Yimou, uh, Zhang Yimou's films have been censored. So Jean Janko slyly acknowledges his financial sources when the titles of the film sections, you'll see them come up. Uh, one of them is called Tokyo Story, so that's for the Kitano connection maybe. Another is called Belleville, the Chinatown district in Paris, where the, where the uh, character Kun flies at the film's conclusion. Hong Kong also enters the story when a crass businessman offers to take Xiao Tao there on a junket. Of course, she doesn't consider going there. She and Taishung have no passports, have never traveled except in their dreams. And you'll see them dream together in a, a mock airplane that's in the park that's going nowhere. Actually, maybe their best moment, uh, I think I'll, yeah, I don't have that here. You'll see them float uh, on a on a, on an, uh, a balloon uh, that in a souvenir concession in the park around the Eiffel Tower. It's a digitized balloon. So these are kind of the cognitive maps: this little airplane and this uh, CGI balloon that orient the two main characters and set them apart from the film's maker and most uh, Western spectators who can travel without thinking twice. They have to travel only within concessions in an air in a in a theme park. In fact, I flew to Toronto to attend the premiere of this film uh, in the West uh, in September 2004. And there in the packed theater in Toronto, this film's images took me into sections of Beijing I had never visited. So the world, like the park which gives it its name, seems to promise, uh, promise exotic tourism to a paying audience. Yet Zha Zhanka's irony undercuts this project. How can we expect any two and a half hour film, uh, a little less than that, you'll be glad to know, uh, uh, to provide more than a caricature of life elsewhere. Still, this is often what we expect when we go to the globetrotting blockbusters like The World Is Not Enough by James, with James Bond or hopscotching along with Vim Vendors is Till the End of the World. For cinema believes itself horizonless, especially in comparison with television, which is generally more national, or with newspapers, which are usually urban and always in local language. Yet the world does not equal the globe, which is a term connoting a homogeneous entirety, the planet seen from the moon, let's say. The world, in contrast, recognizes variety. Indeed, it stands as the sum of variety. To put it crudely, global films expect to entertain audiences everywhere. These are the global blockbusters that we know about and see everywhere. They bring in box office receipts from a distribution network that converts all currency into a single value and is reinvested in franchises. World films, on the other hand, as I think of them, promote the distinctiveness and complexity of their place of origin, which they display for audiences both at home and abroad. As Mark Betts cogently suggests, world cinema has taken the place of what previously, previous generations called art cinema. These are complex movies that reflect on experience and contribute to thought, especially to thought about cinema. While its popular success was minuscule, the world has been one of the most discussed films of the new century, an image from its uh, cover adorns that book that I showed you, World Cinema, Transnational Perspectives, 
evidently cued by its title, we can look for, uh, into this film for something to think about, and more importantly, something to think with. At its highest level of thought, the world intervenes in the opening sequence in the debate about representation and spectacle that Martin Heidegger launched in 1938 with an essay that was subsequently known as The Age of the World Picture. For as the world opens, two modes of uh, apprehension are set off against one another, which is the, the ones I would, defy, I would identify uh, as search, the mode of search, and the mode of display. First comes the search, and I think I will just show you just in second of, uh, if I can do this properly, of the credits that you're going to see in a second, but just so you can understand what I'm, what I'm after here. I love that second cut back to the empty underground where they have all, all the workers have vested themselves for this display for the paying public up, uh, up above. Okay. So even uh, during the credits here, an opposition between two ways of looking has been sealed. The tracking shot searches for its subject in poor light versus a magisterially staged shot whose subjects present themselves in front and center for close-ups. So before and during the, credit film, uh, the credits, films often um, signal the way that we, they expect to be seen. I always make my students come on time and pay real attention to the pre-credit and credit sequences. With this in mind, Jajanka might seem to privilege probing camera over the displayed set in those initial shots. However, he immediately shows the need to account for both dimensions in grasping a subject as large as the world. The vertical dimension of depth gradually emerges in time and the horizontal dimension of simultaneous extension. Both dimensions are present when the main title comes up in a signature shot, that one with the Eiffel Tower rising and congressly in the background of Beijing's dawn skyline, when that old man enters uh, from the left, the trash cleaner. So this man and Ja are not meaning to uh, not meant to be seen by the tourists who arrive to enjoy the world in a day, but definitely they are meant to be seen by us. Indeed, this trash collector haunts the film, reappearing as the old couple. Uh, later on in the film, they'll reappear, I think, as an old couple from Shanxi who come in uh, at the end of the film. You'll you'll notice them. China may project its glossy hypermodernity in the kind of spectacle that you just got a hint of here, but it does so by hiding its poor, as happened during the Olympics. But Zha Zhanka patiently watches those poor images, poor, emerge from the off-screen. This film is apparently about young people bent on living in the, at the lightning speed of electronic communication. The credit shot measures the new China by the look cast on it by the old rag picker. Zha Zhanka's camera will move across contemporary urban life with that old man's deliberate determination. So we experience both the timeless simultaneity of postmodernity and that other timelessness lived for centuries by Chinese peasants and workers. We are afforded an experience of the, fi of the friction of mismatched temporalities and of incommensurable spaces that actually is China today. So the credit sequence crystallizes an aesthetic project to stage a world picture and then probe what it cannot represent. The spectator has been charged to look and to listen for traces that lead toward an elusive subject, the missing class of people that constitutes what I like to call the absent subject of all of Jajanka's films. This challenge of coming to grips with an absent subject pertains to the characters and the spaces that are always just kept out of view like the peasants and the workers, or the dim corridors that you just saw there. But it pertains as well to the often bright surfaces of life in Beijing that spreads out in as, a, as an array of possibilities in front of the film's young characters. The theme park is a metaphor for this world of bright possibilities. You'll see the, the, its logo, give us a day and we will give you the world. But as Heidegger warned, the world can never be identified. Despite all the frames that set it off as a picture to grasp, the world slips out of reach, extending limitlessly, indefinably. As absent subjects, the film's characters have, a, have what they need, yet they are somehow absent, really, from life. They inhabit the world, but the world has lost its substance. Jajanka goes in search of genuine human beings among the zombies in this theme park of a world. And what does he discover? Well, I think he discovers these two dimensions. First, the world is wide. And what I want to now do is prepare you to uh, keep your eyes as open and your ears as, as they can be, because uh, he 
figures out ways to extend this world beyond the confines of this group. He moves his camera in oblique patterns that widen uh, the, the focus to include groups and spaces. A terrific example occurs right here, and I can just continue the credit sequence. Uh, when the, You'll just watch the camera dip, and you'll see this elegantly ha happen all the time. I mean, it's an elegant camera movement. <laughs> so beautiful. You'll see some more of those. Uh, but it, it serves my purpose in suggesting the way the camera will drift from one character to others, and you'll follow another group away from the ones that uh, we think we're watching. So uh, the camera is always motivated by some camera movement, but it will slip away to find uh, others. And also the soundtrack expands to give any location multiple off-screen possibilities. There's an early scene in the Eiffel Tower uh, that involves three characters, and we hear competing voices coming. When you see this, just try to keep your ears open for this. It's quite amazing. Uh, three characters are competing for dialogue space, but there are tourists on the platform. There's loudspeaker at the lunch table. There are recorded voices on the elevator. There's Taishung's cell phone, which is he's listening to. There's a walkie-talkie, which he, he communicates with guards. All of these things are in the sound space of the Eiffel Tower, and it serves as a kind of audio command center, I would say. From this, uh, for this reason, it's a place to which the film returns a couple of more times, later repeating that constant recorded message you'll hear. So the Eiffel Tower stands erect in the wide open space. Many of the film's locations, though, are cramped. And here, I'm, uh, like this, the, um, the, the small spaces where people uh, sleep and dress, uh, dorms really where close quarters hold very few secrets. In the Tawdry Station Hotel, uh, where um, the two main characters argue. Uh, you can hear the trains outside. When Anna and Tao uh, wash their clothes, you can hear Russian folk music to the, in the distance, making us wonder what kind of entertainment's going on. You won't know. And uh, in the important side plot, when uh, Taishung uh, gets involved with a dress designer in the downtown um, uh, sewing district, you can see people working in sewing machines while he's upstairs dancing with Kuhn. So they will soon, as you see here, wrap themselves in a cocoon of seduction sitting on a couch, at least until the sound of Taishung's cell phone tears open that delicate cocoon, taking him off to a different place. So this woman, uh, Kuhn, um, you'll I'll follow this later on, but she widens his erotic horizon and fills out the geographic extension of the film. She's a designer and a seamstress, but if you notice here from the subtitle, um, she fashions her clothes for a new middle class, taking her patterns from Western magazines. Her connection to Europe goes beyond simulating fashion because her husband, we learn, stowed away on a ship for Paris 10 years ago and, she, and expects her to join him there. He comes from the, they both come from the seacoast city of uh, Wenchu, famous for its intrepid sailors and traders. And in a way, she represents Chinese who venture to foreign lands. So she's on the far uh, east side of China, and he, Shanxi Prince, uh, where the man Taishun comes from, is on the western rural side, the mining and sometimes we could think of farming sections, which are much more traditional. And they both speak in different, kinds, different dialects, but they can speak together. Uh, so this is the way that the film, from its central location in Beijing, is able to move itself out into uh, the world beyond the suburb in which it is set. Uh, Tao and uh, Taishung respond to, uh, responded to an advertisement earlier on to come to Beijing, uh, and they move from Shanxi there. Tao may be talented as a dancer, but it is Taishung who has the greater ambition. While maintaining familial ties, he ventures deep into Beijing, spending off hours with a branch of the family, lorded over by Song, who's a kind of maf mafia boss, uh, who sends him on a delicate mission with Kuhn, initiating their um, flirtation and have him dreaming about an even wider life. While Zhang Zhangke follows the thread of Tao and Taisheng and their erotic and uh, love life, effectively, he surveys the larger roster of Chinese character types. Um, and th there she is with um, him on, on the way to China. Pressed together in the, th in the theme park are many, many other people, and you get, to, you get some sense of them, and he doesn't shy away from giving you them. Maybe that's why the film is an hour, uh, two hours and 20 minutes long. His camera and sound recorder move tangentially to pick up background figures. I'm just showing you, uh, there are at least three 
um, avatars of this couple, other couples that he could have taken on. He could have looked at them. Here is uh, Yu Yu, um, who we learn uh, later on is given a, um, a position, a high position in the park because she's uh, sleeping with the boss effectively. And that's what uh, it is a way that, um, that uh, the main character Tao could have gone but doesn't. Okay. Many other characters might be pursued by Zsa Zsanka's sliding camera and sensitive microphone and his effective ethnography of post-adolescence in Beijing. All of the characters from the most least sympathetic are scrutinized within the confused and contradictory milieu that envelops them. Living like servants in, a, uh, cramped, in cramped corners, the young workers of the world deliver luxurious fantasies to the park's paying tourists. To glimpse something of their small lives, he shuttles between public showcase, the theme park, Anonymous sites, the cafe, the, the train station, and private rooms, the hotel, the dormitory rooms, a little car that Taishung has or is able to borrow. Adding to these real spaces and to give further dimension to the film, uh, to the space, Zsa Zsanka deploys the resources not only of a sensitive realist camera, but also of electronic images on flat panels. Uh, for their milieu consists of lots of screens of all sorts, as, and increasingly, if you were there now, if you made the film now, it would even be much more full of these, I'm sure. In the film's most self-referential moment, the one I've already mentioned here, the video souvenir store, you see them sitting in front of a video camera with a blue screen behind them, and so that they can be shown uh, ascending the Eiffel Tower. Um, positioned here, Reality, uh, this, in reality, of course, they've never flown anywhere. For the most part, screens go unremarked, um, but they're all over the place. At the train station, you'll see some, and here, uh, when she returns by bus, Tao pays no attention to these screens on the bus, or even to the Mao's portrait, which you can see outside if you look closely. Uh, in fact, though, she spends more time looking at her cell phone, which rings, uh, and it takes her into a dream space. And you see this several times in the film. How far can you go, the text message reads. We can see the impact of cell phone screens on Tao's face whenever she answers its call, twice in the monorail, then later in the Venetian palace that you see here. Um, at any moment, a message may arrive offering escape. Each animated vision igniting uh, by text appears on the tiny screen in a fantasy of unimpeded movement across vast spaces, a magic car carpet ride. So cell phones open up the dreamscape of those who populate the world. They are, I would say, nodes in a network that links the isolated workers of the world to millions of other young people, all of them ready to be sucked into the possibilities offered by the tiny screens that they hold in their hands. This network, just like the theme park, has shrunk the world and altered the cognitive map that these young Chinese are draw, uh, drawn to when they come to Beijing. In the course of the film, we come across them in India, Egypt, Thailand, Japan, France, the US, and Italy. Those are sections that you'll see in the, in the park as you watch the film. Tao is comfortably told, she's comfortable when she's told she's gonna to play an African girl, because it doesn't matter. She's never left China. She's never seen the ocean. It makes no difference, she, sa she says, actually, both because she cares most about the genuine face-to-face -face relationships uh, that she can have and the places that she inhabits, and because difference is spurious in the theme park where all places are the same. Indeed, Zsa Zsanka implies that difference is a spurious in the horizontal dimension of our changing world, and that's the title of the final chapter of the film. Since today, everything and everyone appear to be completely available everywhere. They're all there on screen. So I'm going to turn more briefly to the second dimension, not the horizontal one that I've just uh, tried to signal, but now to the, the fact is that the world is also deep. So what I've called the absent subject repeatedly opens up like holes in the middle of the world, taking us behind and beneath its surface, whether as picture or as map. Fittingly, we reach this missing dimension through peripheral characters, not through the main ones, I think. The Russian woman, Anna, whom you'll see, See here in a cafe with uh, Tao. We, um, I could, this is a video presentation. I'm not going to have time to play it, though. You'll see it soon enough. We learn little about uh, Anna, and also it opens up through another small character named Little Sister, who's a, a male character who comes to Beijing uh, to earn money as a construction worker and is related to Taisheng. 
In the film's third sequence, Anna and three Russian women enter the dressing room and are introduced to Tao, who is changing out of her India costume. They're new recruits. They're shown around by a man who insists on keeping their passports. Anna is suspicious and reluctant to uh, relinquish hers. Later on, it is Anna who will tell Tao that she must change jobs, needing money to try to visit her sister in Mongolia. As they drink and attempt to communicate right in this scene here, the Weather Channel offers an off-screen TV that brings the weather of uh, Ulaanbaatar uh, on screen, and Anna shrieks in pleasure. She teaches Tao a song learned from her sister about Ulaanbaatar. It's a theme song that we uh, that we're gonna uh, you'll you'll be singing when you leave the theater tonight. Uh, so in this way, women pass on the feelings one to the next without language, but with music, forming a bond more genuine, surely, than that of the cell phone connections. And I'm not going to play this for you, but there's a spectacular long take of them riding on a, a motorized, uh, effectively bicycle that they're being driven on uh, that just has the theme park in the background. And it's very beautiful. It's one of the moments of real connection in the film. She's found in Anna, an older sister, a woman far more alienated than, than, than she herself because she is caught in the Russian sex traffic. And the violations that Anna has been subject to, what are those? Separation and homesickness, we don't really know. But tipsy, they share that o open air cab back uh, to the cafe, from the cafe. Then in, I think the film's most, one of the most affecting moments, uh, they meet in a, in a uh, karaoke bar, in a nightclub, where Anna has been, excuse me, where Tao has been brought by this man who wants to take her to, to Hong Kong. And they will, you'll see them meet uh, accidentally uh, in the restroom. And it's uh, devastating, uh, but it is also a moment of uh, pure communication and authenticity. They, she guesses what's become of her friend and they hold each other. However, you can only remain in a restroom so long. Tao is gonna, will never really learn what happened to Anna. Uh, and the film knows nothing more than it shows of the invisible economy of bodies who work underground in the world. Can these characters watch out for each other? One cannot really watch out for anyone in Beijing's overdrive economy, least of all for those scarcely undocumented laborers who pour into the capital by the thousands. Personified by Little Sister, this is the other absent subject of Zha Zhanka, who edges, as he edges up to to make the audience confront this. And we confront it as well when Xia Tao meets Little Sister on a construction site, and you'll see this uh, happen. Uh, he, and in, I think, the, one of the most remarkable scenes uh, that I know of in modern cinema, we, it takes place in the hospital, and I'm going to let you discover that for yourself, but I'm going to insist that you uh, not forget it. It's only three shots long, uh, the last of which is a spectacular long take, very unobtrusive, you'll see, but it's, uh, it's an amazing lead up to the fate of an unknown person who has, who has a name of little sister that nobody knew. He was the most quiet person from his hometown, a straggler, um, and we see his conclusion here. So he figures here, I think, the nadir of invisibility. And this is the opposite of the Zhang Yimou, Chen Kaiga kind of cinema. We're looking at the where you, you can see nothing, where real life happens in the invisible aspects of it. Empty of humans, you're going to find the, there's a, the, the, the scene concludes on a green wall that is empty of all humans as all humans have left the space. And words come on, the, some words that come out of the soul of this invisible non-entity little sister. It's a remarkable um, idea for a film to have made, and you'll, I'm sure you'll, you'll sense it. It took a filmmaker of the sixth generation to enter into such dispiriting hospital and wring from it, in three extended takes, these sad social truths. That sadness comes from the writing that is superimposed on the wall, but it also lies in the wall itself. And I've got this picture on here, just it's the best I can do, I think, of uh, this institutional green made a depressing, uh, made more depressing by, um, by the kind of orange lights that are on the, uh, there's an orange hue of the lamps illuminating the wall and other parts of the sequence. Uh, I asked uh, Zha Zhanka in an interview I had with him about that green, and I, I hit the jackpot because he said, 
I met that green every day of my life. Moreover, the color not only appeared in the walls of homes, but also in the workplaces. Everywhere, in hospitals, offices, and classrooms, all sorts of public spaces were painted that color. To me, this green comes from real life. It represents my memory about that old system, the China that dates from more than a decade ago, certainly. And most important, it still exists. In the world, we come to the World Park, we can see that there are very bright, glamorous sides of China, but there's also in that other color, green, and, it, and another space existing in China. The two systems are in transition. The new has not entirely taken up the space where the old, and the old is not yet withdrawn to some distant corner of history. So there may be, there they are side by side. In the world, you can still see that green tinge. I constantly ask my cinematographer to work to turn up that green. <laughs> so. So in the devastating hospital scene, Zha Zhanka joins such directors as Ho Shao Shen and Robert Bresson, who pursue oblique gestures to uncover traces of the hidden. Uh, and I think there's an actual reference, not reference to, but there's a, such a similarity between this scene and something that happens in Diary of a Country Priest that I can talk about later on if anybody gets interested in that. After the screening, we can really see how that will, uh, that will work out. Okay, I'm getting to the end so you can actually see this film. Uh, so we get, we are permitted some access to Taisheng and Tao's inner feelings when the text messages that arrive on their phones blow up into full animation. But expanded and colorful LCD screens appear thin and unreal compared to the plaster wall uh, that holds the black lettering of Little Sister's Note, a genuine dingy wall of a genuine dingy hospital where bodies disintegrate and pass away. So this is another one of those depressing spaces that we have as opposed to the spectacle spaces of the world. Zha Zhanka takes up the post-World War II task, not just of Bresson, but of Italian neorealism, to locate those who have never been recognized and to permit them to articulate their aspirations, their own idiolect, while placing them within the conditions of their fraught existence. And just as neorealism explored a devastated Europe where uprooted, impoverished humans wandered with little agency, so he explores a China whose ambitious young people find themselves channeled into what are literally and figuratively, figuratively construction zones, where they live really not only with diminished agency, but with diminished dreams. Yet Zha goes beyond neorealism in asking whether this humanism can persist in a world where the human body is no longer the standard of measure. And that's its real difference. That's what's happened in the 50 years or 70 years since that. Miniaturization, the world park, cell phones, everything's small, and maximization, immense screens, the limitless city, these threaten everything we thought was human. China appears to be out of scale to us in the West, a billion and a quarter a human beings is an unfathomable quantity, I think. Uh, how could any of them count? And how could the countless form anything like a society? Their best chance of belonging comes in the world. For there they are provided uniforms, that is in the, the, the theme park. They're provided uniforms as guards or as performers, designed to bring the monumental down to scale. Designed, that is, to make Chinese at home in a world and content to be where they are. But Tao is not really content uh, she demands the authentic, and in a very famous scene, famous for the film, for me anyway, she asks about fidelity, which is really about asking about authenticity. She will not accept stimulations nor simulations of theme parks, karaoke, animated dreams, or casual affairs. She refuses, uh, really, the age of the world picture. <laughs> Does Zha Zhanka share her inflexible insistence on authenticity? In one interview, he hinted that, as a kind of ethnographer, he aimed to show Chinese urban life for what it is, the rapid molecular motion of particles in confined space. Traveling in statistical masses through complex trajectories, these molecules, these humans that are all these Chinese running from, the, uh, from somewhere in the middle between village and city, they cluster and, and find affiliations under multiple forces of dislocation. Tao's friend, Niu, and Wei cling to each other and marry hurriedly. You'll see that. They're afraid of being attracted out of the orbit, out of the orbit that gives them what stability they have. Yet no one should expect the, their marriage or their conjoining to be permanent, I would say. As for Tao, she's like a free ion, lost in the commotion of modern social disarray. Zha Zhanka and the spectator can empathize with her while realizing that she follows a need that cannot be easily fulfilled in postmodernity. Attached to her hometown past, she has little chance of surviving the world. 
Well, what about the fate of this movie? Does it have a chance? In revival houses, it played in the U.S. only, uh, excuse me, in its initial run in the U.S., uh, which I tracked, it played in only three theaters for, for a 10-week re- run. But its grim death at the box office was perhaps only the beginning, a famous line in the film, because it has a new life, on, had a new life on a DVD, on Blu-ray now, in revival houses, in classroom screenings, and in great ser- uh, film series like this one. Its only beginning is the hopeful refrain of every cinephile as the cinema screen lights up. Let's see what happens and meet uh, once the lights come up again at the end of the film and after we emerge from the experience of the world. Thank you. Um, but yeah, please, Deadly will be presenting tomorrow in the conference as well. So that's another reason why we're probably not going to stay too long today. But yeah, please, um, if you still want to have any questions, uh, the microphone. Are there already any questions um, on the top of your head? Yeah. Yes, um, good evening or good night. <laughs> Um, well, my actual question is, is the couple dead or not? <laughs> Should we take a poll? Uh, <laughs> I looked carefully through many interviews with Zhajanka, and he has uh, been very cagey about not revealing what he thinks about it. Um, there are some people that think it's they have a kind of Buddhist interpretation of the film, that they're going into a, another life, that this they've won, run through this one and you've seen what it is, and they'll come out in a different way. Is, uh, there, uh, is there much of a spiritualist side to Jar Jan Kerr as a filmmaker, as a person? I've, it's never c- struck me as much. No, it, ha- it hasn't. That's why I, I'm not terribly convinced by that uh, interpretation, because he hasn't really mentioned much of that before. Yeah. So, and If anybody wants to venture, um, it seems like, I mean, she has the key line early on, if you ever are unfaithful, I'll kill you. Uh, and... <laughs> Uh, she takes over the. She leaves without saying anything, and she's catatonic. And with that stove right next to them, um, it seems like she's made a decision about uh, the uselessness of a life that they've been living or that is lived in that situation. So I've generally felt that that um, yeah, she decided to finish off that story. The shades of the ending of um, the marriage of Maria Brown in that in that kind of mystery about is it. A deliberate death or not um i had a question deadly uh i thought i mean one of the bit the big laughs in the film uh but also i think uh, one of the key moments in the film is the when a tour guide is showing uh the group uh the the the, the recreation of manhattan and he says oh we, we still have the twin towers like our ones are still there and i wonder i mean this is uh, but Be- Baudrillard said, uh, you know, Disneyland is the real America. Like all of America is fake, except it, we pe- we think Disneyland is fake, but actually all of America is fake, and Disneyland is is the real bit. Can we say the same about the theme park and China? Is is Jajanka Baudrillardian, or is there something else going on? Well, I think he is de- definitely suggesting that there's a kind of one-upmanship that uh, China is uh, outlasting the U.S. because it uh, is able to have what it wants in its own way and um, yeah, and has its own safe protections. It's No one's going to get into that, uh, into the world park um, and tear it down. Uh, no terrorists. It's heavily guarded. It's uh, heavily yeah. guarded. Um, uh, so I know I think the film is in, in absolutely about the Baudrillard concerns, uh, not concerns, but I don't think, I think that the, with characters like Xiao Tao um, and Anna, particularly, and maybe with the peasants that he comes from, he's suggesting that there is a, that's what I was trying to suggest at the end of the introduction, that um, that there is a kind of deeper humanity that is I- almost invisible now, and uh, that's why the film ends in a, a working class area out completely outside the lights. Uh, the snow is coming down, It's so winter is coming to freeze things over. But she wanted the winter to come. It finally shows up when she dies. Um, but it's as if it's a kind of, a kind of grace uh, that can be seen at the end, or felt 
this is ch there's a change so i i think that he holds up the baudrillard issue that uh, there are we're living in a world of screens and that's what, what what's left um but he and she wants something more for sure and i sense the camera and the narration behind it siding with her at least wanting us to remember that that's still there Professor, uh, I live in Frankfurt. I actually came from Beijing, but I've never been to the park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Jia Zhangke is one of my favorite film directors. The last uh, uh, lecture, I'm also here. Uh, for me, it's kind of like a mixed, uh, I'm sometimes laughing and also I feel really sad because in China it's huge. It's also touching me because uh, like general, uh, I'm from a, a good family, but uh, most people in China, they, they want to travel the world, but certainly like uh, uh, construction workers, they never, not even in Beijing for them, is suffering. So for me, it's kind of like a really, uh, by this film, very touching because Jia Zhangke always um, have a very sensitive point for this uh, lower class people. And uh, in his film, I remember the slogan, uh, give us one day, I show you the world. <laughs> I was kind of like really sad to, to, to see this, but also for me, I've never been there. <laughs> yeah, I live in Beijing, but I've never been to this park because also I, 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 I travel the world, I, I go to a lot of countries, but I'm a lucky one. <laughs> but so you don't need to go to <laughs> Yeah, but also actually I, I, I'm here as a Chinese uh, person, I'm always uh, curious about how the uh, Western world uh, criticize about this, this fake cities, like a uh, world park. But in my eyes, it's kind of like um, in last 30 years, China in a rapidly changed time. It's just uh, uh, they try to build something, make the citizens happier. But I know that's copy everything. It's also I'm laughing together with him. <laughs> Sometimes I go to uh, Egypt, you know, some like <laughs> also like in Japan. But now I'm in India, so it's kind of really funny. <laughs> so I just uh, uh, I want to know from your opinion, uh, what most touching you from this film, the storytelling line about this park, the whole thing, for me it's kind of really, I first time see this film. I really like it, yeah. Well, it's a wonderful remark. I'm really gratified that uh, someone from the place uh, is touched by the film in ways that are probably different from the way it... Um, I actually, I am embarrassed to say that I haven't been there. I've been to Beijing t twice or two or three times since the film was made and I've never bothered to go out there. The film was not shot entirely in Beijing. There is such a park and it's it's in the suburbs. It's getting older now. But there's also one in Shenzhen that is, uh, and this was actually more of it was shot, you know, production wise at that park. Um, but we have, uh, I've never been to the Disneyland Small World. There we have, in the US, we have several things like this. And it's, I mean, it's a fantasy that, uh, I wouldn't say a fantasy, but it's a way of possessing things that, uh, in a way, is almost too obvious that uh, you pay some money and you have, for a day, uh, a sense of owning everything, having seen everything, and being able to talk about it. Um, and uh, there is something gratifying about it, and it's wonderful for a cameraman to be able to set up shots that uh, are able to put you in front of a sphinx, or uh, he, he stages things wherever he wants to. So it's a, a glorious opportunity to make a film like this, and then he tells another story of the people underground. And I, I, it's mostly those scenes in the hotel rooms and the train station, um, and on the bus with all those screens shape, facing you, that uh, you see a, the kind of China that people are living in, and maybe even the sewing shop where you, we know how many clothes come from there. And this is a high-end clothing shop, evidently. It's not a, um, a, a, a sweatshop. They're, they're making uh, clothes for people that have enough money to want European mark co clothes. But, yeah, counterfeit. Counterfeit ones, yeah, but that's, uh, that's a big market there. Yes, there's good counterfeit and there's bad, and, okay. and she's good at her work. Um, the scene, I hope you understood, the one thing that sometimes people don't understand, but maybe it was obvious that uh, when the the uh, relatives from uh, Shanxi receive the de uh, indemnity money, and then the next shot is they're out at the site where he worked, or where he was killed, what he, which she found beautiful, and he, uh, little sister said, maybe it's not so beautiful to me yet. Um, and the they're burning the money, but this is just 
a ritualistic uh, funeral money, uh, money that you build when uh, you you burn when someone dies. It's it, which does have a religious significance, but it's an old tradition that uh, from from China it always happens. So they they take the real money, they burn the other money, but then they move across, and you see the two. Uh, p people sitting on the wall, and it's exactly the famous final shots, uh, or fa a famous shot toward the end of Tokyo Story of the two old parents who can't live in the big city and want to say it's time to go home, where they're sitting on this fence and looking out at the sea, and the music from Tokyo Story is playing. So it's both a homage to <laughs> the Japanese companies that uh, financed the film to Jajaka's attempt to tie himself to... Um, Ozu, uh, one of the greatest of all filmmakers, and to the spirit of that very long movie uh, about the difference between an older generation from the countryside and the new city that they come and can kind of appreciate but need to go away and are kind of sent away from. So it's, a, it's actually a beautiful reference and a pretty big one, uh, I think, in the film. Uh, Dudley, I wanted to ask you about the cell phones in the, f in the film, or the mobile phones, as we, as we say in Australia. Um, there's, I, I, the film, when it initially came out, is the cell phones are treated as, you know, these are these objects of modernity, of networks, uh, communities, and so on and so forth, uh, as kind of like the ultimate markers of this technological advance. And to us now, uh, I, they almost seem quaint, these kind of pre-smartphone era, you know, flip phones and so on and so forth. Uh, almost like, I mean, it's like a, it's like a steam train or something from our um, perspective today. And that there's still a sense, compared to the kind of smartphone, compared to the present day interaction with smartphones, there's a sense that there's still at least a human relationship being kind of conveyed through these cell phones in a way that uh, is possibly lost in the smartphone era where you're just kind of part of a, a Borg. Yeah, you point to something that uh, struck me this time. I haven't seen it in a couple of years. Um, and uh, yeah, there may be some obsolescence built into the film. There's almost no way to avoid that. Uh, one way he might have protected himself from this is by the quality of the animation. I am on record for not knowing anything about animation <laughs> and kind of being opposed to the form. It's not the kind of cinema that I care for. Usually, I mean, I like to watch, I, I admire it, but I just don't pay much attention to it. But all of my students who do watch this film with me and I grow up on animation are kind of appalled by the kind of crudity of the of the animated sequences. But it might be linked to the, um, uh, the, the rudeness of the phones, that it's all uh, these, this is nice stuff for the people that are there, but it is not at the high end. Uh, and that might have something to do also, I don't know how you feel about the music either, which I still find attractive enough to carry you through the film. I think it really, really works, but it's also, um, he, he's bringing you into the world of uh, the techno world to some extent, but keeping it at a, at a moment of transition before it uh, is uh, completely wraps everybody's life uh, around together in a new way. So this is not uh, shockingly great animation. I also noticed, uh, which I, and I probably, as I rethink the film, I've always thought that the cell phone images that uh, come through on the screens are something like the, the dreams and wishes that people pour into their phones. And it's less of that. I think the, it's used really pretty, in as, as pretty standard location transitions most of the time. I mean, I guess I always knew that, but uh, it's usually a way to get from one set to another, or one part of uh, Beijing to another. So um, it's a, I think, very uh, well done and smooth device that keeps the f a very a very long film built into sections, having more variety in it than otherwise. So it allows the segmentation of the film to to proceed uh, with the regularity of cell phones going off and slightly changing your life as they do. One thing happens to another. I really love the one when. Uh, when Xiao Tao is calling from the, and I hadn't really noticed it before watching it, calling from the hotel room that she's gotten where she's going to meet him, and he's with the other woman, uh, but you've got the, uh, you know, a shot of the cell phone and just the, the hopes and the erotic desire even that's put into looking at a little screen is is really pretty palpable there, and he doesn't want to answer it, and then when he does answer, it's the uh, the call to go to um, the hospital. I, I hope you, I am more and more impressed. It's one of the greatest shots I know in cinema when uh, 
I, I went on about it, so I don't need to, I guess, repeat it again, but uh, the last shot in the hospital when he comes out, and you don't know it's going to go on for so long, but it's a really long shot, and the camera just keeps uh, the characters in view and lets them stand and move away from view, and then when you finally get the, the this independent track back onto the, uh, pull, pull back onto the green wall, and then you get all of that cell phone <laughs> animation comes to life in a new way when he, the director himself, puts on the screen the inner feelings, the last moments of this poor guy from Shanxi whose last thought in life is the debt that he owes, these paltry debts to people that he, that's why he was working at night. And uh, so it's, it's a fabulous uh, culmination of the use of that, um, of that figure of filmmaking. Um, you highlighted green in your introduction. It's the, it's it's interesting. I mean, it's the color of the of China's socialist past. Let's say it's the color of hospitals, of public services, um, which is curious because usually it's kind of red that we associate with that political um, uh, uh, tendency. And then the color of its of uh, this kind of consumer capitalist present is, it's it's almost cliched to say that it's gold. Is uh, I mean where like. We see this all this glittering kind of uh, glistening uh, golden palette whenever we get this kind of like the moments of like real like embeddedness in kind of uh, uh, kind of the modern day hyper capitalism. Uh, thinking in particular about that scene where she's talking to the guy who wants to take her to Hong Kong. Oh yeah, well that's. Um, it's I mean yeah, it's the, totally, it's so full on yeah, gold but, and bright and kind of almost blinding, right. and, um, but also the. Um, the kind of the spectacle scenes as well, the big show business numbers, they seem to have this kind of glistening golden hue to them. Well, there's a lot of glistening. A lot of it just has to do with lighting. I think there are a lot of colors in those spectacle scenes. And I mean, Xiao Tao wears a lot of green in the film. I mean, she's, uh, so it's, I don't want to overdo the green part. I think there really is a difference between the way he designed the color scheme of the spectacles and then the costumes that the people would be wearing at other moments versus the settings where he was going to um, place the characters outside of the um, uh, of the theme park. So, uh, Vincent, did you have a question? No? Okay. <laughs> hey, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Time to get, does anyone want to stop us from going to bed uh, with one last question? Uh. I don't have a question, but just an anecdote. Uh, we are, the next film that is programmed is Dong, and that's about the, an artist called Liu Xiaodong. It's a documentary. And we see Liu Xiaodong in this film. I don't know if you know that, uh, in this scene where they are in the um, karaoke. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because he's he's rather famous. So if you know how he look, what he looks like, so if you sing Dong, you might recognize that he plays a part here in the world as that uh, guy that is trying to... Uh, I know a very unpleasant guy actually in the same scene on, on the karaoke. So yeah, we're gonna get to see. Uh, he's the, he's the masher, the guy that's uh, that's hitting on uh, Xiao Tao. He's not the one that is hitting on her. He's the other one. Huh? He's he's the other one. Oh, the singing. The singing her. Oh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, he was more attractive. He was okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're gonna get to see more of uh, Liu Xiaodong um, in the documentary Dong. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for our next uh, event. I thank uh, Dudley Andrew very much for your presence here tonight, for your presentation and for your talk. Thank you very much, Daniel Fairfax, as well, for the moderation. And I hope to see you at the next lecture in films. Thank you very much.